Welcome to Short Cover Lit. I'm Adrian Ford. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here with this week's review. It is a short story this time. Dalton, what review be this? We are back to form this month, doing our reviews on Tuesdays. And since this is the month of October, we are doing The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. Yes. Uh, October, I believe Oct- it's called. Potober or October? I like October. One of our commenters left that, and it completely outclasses me, <laughs> and I hate you for it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, what do you want to start with this? Three good things, three bad things? That's where we normally start. That's where we know. I'm not familiar. It's been so long. You ruined all of last month. I did. Uh, three good things. Uh, this along. is a great example of Stephen King's description of terror, horror, and the grotesque. Which I will get into that a lot. Uh, that's that's going to be the brunt of my talking points. I believe that comes from Don's Macabre, of which we will have a quickie later this month. I have no idea where it came from, but I liked it, so I stole it. <laughs> uh, this is short, but it does accomplish what is it in- what it is intending to do. And this is the definition of an unreliable narrator, which makes the reader question everything. Okay. Um, one... Poe does not strain to reach the gothic tone in the way that many writers do. Okay. Perhaps because they are trying to channel Poe as opposed to write a gothic story. Two, there is nothing supernatural at play here, but that doesn't stop the story from feeling elevated above the mortal plane. Three, though the diction here would be, cons- would be considered alternative today, there are a few words that would, that would vex a sixth grader. Uh, So this could be a wonderful tool for building young readership. Which it is very commonly used for. It's a lot of high school reading here. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe. I actually had a a, a $1 bargain bin Walmart edition of this as a child child. Really? Yes, I remember that. Uh, I have like a child's version of The Raven that somebody bought me because they're like, you like books? Here's a book! Yeah, it Uh, seems to be (laughs) a lot of people say... You're a very serious person, and you you like to read. You must like Poe, yeah. right? Yeah. You're, you're a writer, and you're an alcoholic. You must like Poe. <laughs> We've always talked about doing Poe, and then like it, when it comes up, we're like, no. Not doing it. No, but we gave in. Yep. Uh, bad things. Uh, we are left to wonder the, remaining, the remainder of this story. It's a very abrupt ending. Uh, Poe's writing is not life-changing. It's his approach to writing at the time he was writing that made him famous. Uh, This writing is not going to change your life. Okay. And more lore, more mythos, more of the supernatural in this makes this a horror story. Uh, I'm going to defend the fact that this is a terror story. Okay. One, this is is a surprisingly short piece. short, Short enough that I think the suspense suffers because of it. Two, because of this, the suspense from is he crazy to now he's caught is just 24 words. Three, I think the abrupt nature uh, at the beginning actually stifles the story because it tr- it keeps the reader from ever actually trusting the narrator. And you brought up that this is a faulty narrator, right? This yes. is an untrustworthy narrator. Absolutely so. Uh, but for that to necessarily work in a story, you shouldn't know it until later in the story. Okay. You have to discover that, as opposed to being led in with, true, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad, right? That's actually me writing in my journal, (laughs) say, too nervous, I'm just a little nervous. Swirly. Uh, Anyway, uh, some quotes from this. Uh, I have two here. One will exemplify the piece and the narrator, and the other will defend terror above horror. Uh, The first, the narrator. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what uh, dissimulation, I cannot talk today, I went to work. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have one? Go ahead with the other. Okay. Uh, And I will get into terror, horror, grotesque. uh, That's the thing that makes Monse do gifts. Oh, it does, actually. She does that, because she says I have alien hands when I do that. Uh, whatever. Uh, I kept quiet, still, and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, 
night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Now, I want you to read that again, but I want you to put your Poe voice on. Poe voice? If you were narrating this story, how would you read it? Exactly. If, 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 you, were being, if you were being paid... Oh, no, this. no, I'm not going to give you a creepy voice. Do it. Uh, if you say Poe voice, I just imagine he was so coked out of his mind. He's like, I kept quiet and still. Uh, your quote, please. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight... When all the world slept, it, had, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. So where would you like to begin with this? I think you've got more interesting points okay. probably than I do this time. So let's break down uh, what Stephen King describes. And you know, Stephen King. Well, Stevie. If you're going to talk horror, you have to mention Stephen King. The King. Uh, terror, horror, and the grotesque. And I'm probably yes. butchering this whole wonderful spiel, but just bear with me. Terror is... Number one, top okay. of the pyramid, what you strive to do. Okay. Uh, this is the unknown, the fear. I, I'm very, excuse me, animated. Uh, this is the fear, the unknown, that you're striving to do as an author. This okay. is the true terror of the piece. Right. That's the highest order. Yes. That, highest that order. is what you want. The horror is the monster. The, the killing, uh, the pop, the scare. Uh, it is not as good as terror, but it is necessary. For this genre. And then there's the grotesque, which Stephen King admits he will slip in when he wants to, when he needs to. Uh, but it's the cop-out. It's the, uh, the slasher flick. The jump scare. Uh, the jump scare, the blood splatter, the grotesque. This particular short story is terror with grotesque. There is little to no horror here. This is the man creeping in your bedroom in the middle of the night. The unknown fear... That you're being watched while you're sleeping. Uh, which is what that quote on 499 of my book, Stop It, uh, brought forth. I kept quiet still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Now read it again, but do your pull voice. No. Uh, this is the man creeping on you in the middle of the night. That is true terror. The fear of something being there that you don't know, that you don't see. Because we've all woken up in the middle of the night. You've all woken up in the middle of the night. You've all been in this situation. You, Dalton, you've never woken up in the middle of the Absolutely night. Absolutely not. I don't sleep. Ask Twitter. They know. Uh, but no, this is the pinnacle of terror. That is true fear. True, innate... Is that a word? <laughs> yes. Human fear. <laughs> I'm on a tyrant. Excuse me. There is little to no tyrant. horror. Shush. There is little to no horror here, though. Okay. Uh, you do get the reveal, but it's so brief. It, it's one paragraph, I think, where it's the reveal, where I jumped upon him. Immediately grotesque. Immediately I'm murdering the man. Immediately I'm watching the vulture eye fade, and then I'm dismembering him. Yeah. So, to call this a horror story is very lack thereof. This is a story of fear, of terror, and of Hollywood grotesque. So you're saying that this is misclassified as gothic horror? Maybe. Maybe. I think so. Uh, the gothic horror seems to set up a very specific ambiance. Uh, if you wanted to go more towards dark and dreary night. Uh, whoa, who am I trying to quote? The old wheels are turning back there. Uh, deep into that darkness peering long I stood there. Uh, is that Poe? Maybe. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, but that's the classic uh, gothic horror setup. The dark night, the uh, the ambiance that sets this. You don't get a lot of that here. You don't. You get the terror of a madman. And you get his stalking of his prey. And then you get the kill. And then you have the immediate. The immediate. It flips straight back to terror. There's no horror here. There's no monster. This is the fear of getting caught. Because if you want to take the uh, narrator as reliable, then it's the fear of getting caught. It's the uh, police officers in the room. Uh, you're trying to, you know, cover everything up. You're trying to hide. But deep within, you know that I just murdered a man. 
Yes. His body is dismembered. It's here beneath us. Uh, it's that fear, uh, that uh, subconscious beat of your own heart that's making you think that it's the beat of another right. man's heart. Uh, if you say he's unreliable in the gift of the supernatural, it's still terror. There's no horror there. There's no creature, no unfathomable horror. Well, that's if you say he is reliable, right? If he is reliable, and that... then it's pure terror because this is a madman. No, 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 no. If he is reliable, he's not a madman. If he is reliable and that heart is beating under the floor um, to to the volume that he says it is, yes. then it's horror, right? Because there is the monster. There is the there is the surreal. I <sighs> there is the unnatural. Maybe so. Maybe that's our only element of horror in here is believing the narrator. Is believing the narrator. But the narr narrator clearly sets him up to be unreliable throughout the entire piece. There's right. no reason that you should believe the narrator. Uh, so that's my rant on this. Uh, thoughts. That's good stuff. <laughs> that's right. You, you think I never give you a credit? That's right. That's because you rarely make oh, points. Oh, Thanos. Um, but no, that's exactly what's going on here. Okay. Um... But I, I think it is it is interesting to dissect most of those horror elements from from the, through the lens of Stephen King because he is the king. Yes, right. And this is a man who sat down and uh, basically termed all of this. Uh, he gave this a you could break this down, but he gave you the words to do so, the tools right. to do so. Uh, the narrator, though, uh, it, it leads to the question whether you want to believe the narrator or not. What is truly the more frightening approach to this? Uh, if you do believe the narrator and you say this is actually happening, it's terrifying. But in an unnatural way. In, in an a unnatural way that we can way. say, well, that will never happen here, right? If this is just it's... a psychopath who is losing his mind, it's still terrifying. Right. Either because, way you go. Because that old man didn't figure on, on a psychopath living with him. Correct. Right. Correct. So I don't know, what, I don't know which way is more scary. I yeah. don't know which way is, is worse. Uh, one of my main points here is, who is the implied audience? The implied audience? You've got a narrator telling a story. It is first person. Okay. He must be speaking to someone, right? Okay. Mm. Who is he speaking to? Uh, you could say possibly a jury if there's a conviction going here, because he does reference, you know, the officers. So this is past the murder. Yeah, this is post-arrest. Yes. Uh, so that could be the audience This here. is happening in the United States, so he is guaranteed a trial. Absolutely so. Uh, I imagine it as a lawyer. Yeah? This is your lawyer. Okay. This is your representation. you got to speak to your representation. And if that is the case, and this person is still going with the idea that I heard that heart beating under the floor, then what we're really dealing with is a faulty narrator. Okay. To the extent that he will not question himself, even when pressed with probably the death penalty this time, yes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For killing someone. No question about it. So I think that that is interesting. Uh, it, the narrator's a very interesting character in this piece, uh, because it is hard to distinguish what's actually going on here. Yeah. Uh, because this is the narrator's story. Uh, he's taking you along for the ride on this one. You've got no one else's point of view. And this is all that you have. So you do have to really put your own point of view in this. However, there is a glimmer of pure truth in this. And that is when the narrator allows the officers into the house. Uh, having a background in criminal behavior and whatnot. Uh, being, this is the return to the scene of the crime. Yeah. Uh, this is inherent to many crimes. Uh, usually people always return for run one reason or another. Serial killers especially, right? They're yes. They're going to go back to where they're... A lot of times if you're trying to catch a serial killer, you stake out where they were bur where they buried their, their prey. Yes. Uh, that's more along the lines of it's more prized and coveted. Uh, however, when he is cornered by those officers, that's when the heart starts beating. That's when the panic sets in. And yes. try as he must to put on a straight face and say there's nothing wrong, he breaks down. Yeah. That's what happens. That's truth yeah. in this piece. Uh, so it is very interesting to have a very unreliable narrator. But when he gets to this point, he is brutally honest of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, so it is really hard to distinguish what's going on with him. Well, I think, I think for me, you've got 
the guy with uh, the cataract, right? Mm-hmm. And you've got the officers. And those are the only other characters in the story. Okay. Both, all three, are completely surprised at everything this guy says, right? Yes. That guy with the cataract does not believe that he's in his room. Uh, those officers do not believe that he's killed someone. Oh, they just no. had to come and check out a noise. Oh, yeah, it's all good, no it's problem. All, it's all fine, bud. We just get, we'll just we be on our way. Let us in, we'll snoop around a bit, and we'll be on our way. Okay, uh, but again, looking from a uh, criminal justice standpoint here, very often the person who commits the most heinous crime is the person you least suspect. This is the Ted Bundy, uh, the very char- charismatic, right. likable guy. Uh, who will evade the police for a long time because, oh, no, it's all good. We just heard a scream. We're just checking in. But you said it was you. It's fine. Uh, so there is truth here. Yeah. Which makes the narrator both reliable and unreliable. Because how... in his account, this is how he is actually... This is it. Right. But all of the truth that he is speaking is in accordance to his own actions. Yes. What he is saying is what he believes is truth. Yes. Which makes him unreliable. But the story himself is verbatim the truth of his. Which is a, a wonderful little weaved circle right. there that I just made. Uh, but it, it is good. That makes, makes it interesting. Right. Uh, that creates the terror of the peace. Right. The last thing I really have to comment on is the idea of passage of time. Okay. It's interesting to note here. Uh, as well as the psychological effect that it has on the reader. You've got that passage where you mention he snuck into the bedroom and stood still for hours yes that's one sentence you read it very quickly but that image is locked in your mind yes of someone observing a person in their sleep for hours at a time without moving without moving a muscle and what that does is when that narration moves on that image of a man being washed in his sleep for hours Flips into the back of your mind. Yes. So that terrifying element is here the whole time, right? So you were left to have to deal with that on your own. Okay. So that passage of time there, hours happening very quickly. And at the end of the story, where these hours happen in fractions of sentences, right? Oh, yeah. Very rapid. Everything's happening just like this. And we go from, here's, here's a lasting um, little antidote from this, maybe, if, if I can say it that way. Whenever you, you read about Ted Bundy, for example, things like that, um, boy, everything was going smooth until it wasn't. Yes. But the paranoia kept everything unsmooth the whole time. It eats at you. Right. So, there's that sudden collapse in this story, where the narrator goes from in charge of everything, from from killing the guy, to holy, holy moly, I gotta get out of this. Yes. Like that. Snap of a finger. Yes. Right? Um, and I think that the paranoia of a criminal is, is very much that way. You don't know when, when everything's gonna drop immediately. Right? It's standing beneath the axe just waiting for it to fall. Right. So you feel it throughout the whole story. Okay. And that is a very interesting th- way to to weave it. Because you have from the very beginning that this story has already gone down. Yes. Right? Something's not right here. Okay. You think I'm crazy. I know you do. Okay. Uh, I would like to bring up again the, the simplicity of this. Uh, and it is unfortunate, in my opinion, that it is so brief. Especially with, you know, him standing for hours on end watching a man sleep if you have never witnessed someone standing just perfectly still watching anything right for hours that stays with you for minutes that stays with you a person being that still for minutes is terrifying uh now to read it and to get it briefly you're probably going to glaze over it but if you sit there and read it carefully and that vision is there for you that's going to stay with you. Throughout the piece, it's there uh, for you, right? That is delightfully unnatural and something that no one should ever have to see, as right. simple as it is. Uh, now, I would like to comment a little bit about the evil eye of the victim here, the vulture's eye, if you will. Uh, is this a hint at some mythos, some lore, or is this just an old man with cataract? 
Well, I, th I, I don't know what it is hinting at. I'm sure that Poe has something he's intending. Okay. I didn't get that far. But in the story, I think that it literally is an old man with cataracts. I'd agree with you there. Uh, in the literal sense, it's probably an old man with cataracts. Uh, however, given the time period of this piece, uh, and I, I'm assuming it's cleaning at the cliche of the evil eye. You give someone the evil eye, that's how you hex them. Uh, early American ignorance towards... Uh, possible witchcraft, uh, whatever. Right. Uh, that's what I'm assuming this is getting at. And I think, had there been more with that, this would have solidified this as a supernatural horror short story. Uh, if there was some reliability to what the evil eye was, if this man was really being cursed, there was some supernatural element, that would have changed the story dramatically. Uh, but to keep it very uh, ambigu ambigu ambiguous... Ambiguous? Uh, it works because alongside the narrator you don't know what's going on uh, it's very unreliable and this is probably just an old man well I think to, to make it ambiguous though you have to take out that first paragraph where he introduces yes. himself as crazy yes right because once you do that you're opening the story up to all sorts of interpretations to all sorts of possibilities to all sorts of realities uh, you know, again, to get into a realistic interpretation of this, uh, usually when someone sits down and says, hey, I'm crazy, let me tell you this, they're not. They're feigning. Right. Uh, and so, when someone sits you down and says, hey, I'm sane, let me tell you a story. That's when you worry. You're not. You're not. That's when you worry. Uh, do you have anything else you really want to get at with this? Uh, I think that's all I've really got here. A very brief story, uh, a lot that you can take from it, but there's not too much here, really. Well, and maybe I, this is just because a lot of people have read this a lot. Yeah, I, I think that, as with anything we read, there's going to be layers that we never get to. There's going Correct. to be layers that, if we get to many layers, there's going to be layers you can't get to in a 24-minute-ish review, okay. right? Uh, what would you rate this? I would give this 80 cataracts out of 100. 80? Uh, I gave this 83 beating hearts. So, okay. as always, you know, just a little higher because it's a short story, right, not a poem. Right. Uh, suggestion? Uh, because I Could Not Stop for Death by Emily Dickinson. Okay. Uh, it's the same time frame. It's got the same mood. It's got the same tone. Point. Um, because I Could Not Stop for Death, he kindly stopped for me. I think that there are, I think that there are a lot of similarities in a lot of things that maybe we could get around to a video doing sometime. Mm. More Emily Dickinson. Mm. Uh, I gave a nod of the hat to Stephen King and suggested Gerald's Game. Uh, dealing with a very unreliable narrator, somebody who's going through uh, some kind of psychotic breakdown as a narrator telling the story. Uh, I think there's a lot of similarities there as well. So, if you like this kind of thing, we're going to be doing a lot more Poe in October. Uh, October, I'm still going to hope that one wins. October. Uh, and uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below to follow us through this entire month of Halloween-esque horror stories etc. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Strip Cover and on Facebook at Strip Cover Lit.